verse 20 and 21, Paul has given to us the Christian philosophy of life and death. The distillation of his desire, let God be magnified, whether I live or, or whether I die. The summary of Christian experience in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. No sooner has he written that, that he finds himself locked upon the horns of a dilemma. And he has two choices, and he finds it very difficult to make his choice between the two. You see it there at the end of verse 22, Yet what I shall choose, I wot not, or I know not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He says, I have a real desire to depart this world. Yet I also have a, a real desire to remain in this world. And he's torn between the world he now lives in and the world which is to come. Maybe an illustration will help. You can think of a, a ship that's anchored in the harbour and it's in the midst of a storm and the wind is blowing from the land out to sea at the same time that the tide is rapidly drawing out. And both of these things are pulling upon the ship and the, the ship is anchored in the harbour and the, the anchor begins to strain. It's like the Christian in this world living in this tension between two worlds. We have a desire to depart and be with Christ, and yet we have a desire to remain and serve Christ in this world. Our theme this afternoon then from these verses is the Christian torn in two. First of all, as Christians, we are pulled toward heaven. Now, that pull is stronger in some than it is in others. And there are various reasons for that. It may be due to circumstances. If we have a particularly hard time on earth, maybe we have prolonged chronic illness, it's going to make us long to be released from that and to go to heaven in order that we might enter into that eternal weight of glory. It may be our degree of spirituality. We might be in our minds too taken up with this world. It's stronger in some than it is in others. It's stronger in the one Christian at some times over against others. You might think even of a young Christian over against an old Christian. And they might be equally spiritually minded. But there's something natural that the older you get, weariness with the world increases. The aches, the pains, they come into play. You're not able to do what you once were. And your whole focus on the brevity of life is sharpened, isn't it? The young person naturally thinks that he's got decades to live in this world and, and there's nothing wrong with that in the ordinary course of things. That is usually the case. But God places this longing in one way or one, uh, one way or another to, to, to some strength or degree in every Christian's heart. We're brought to Jesus Christ, and in him we find an all-sufficient saviour. We thought we lived, but then we realised that life was a life of death, and we come to Christ and we know life in a way that we never experienced it before. We come to the table of the Lord, and we feast by faith upon the Son of God, and we get glimpses, and our hearts are ravished by those little visions and experiences of love that we receive. But even while we sit there at that table, hanging over it all, there are those words, till he come. There's something more. 
And so the Christian is on the one hand satisfied, but yet dissatisfied. He's come to Christ and he rejoices that his sins are forgiven, but yet in his heart he knows what it is to groan. To groan indeed with the whole of the creation for the finality of his redemption when Jesus comes at the last day. We know what it is to live in a world of sin under the curse. We know what it is to have a hard life and to long for rest. And so we think about heaven. And all of those things come into play when we think about heaven. When life is hard, we think, oh, then I will rest. When trials and tribulations are deep and heavy, then we think, well, the Lord has promised to alleviate all of these when we get to heaven. But yet when you read what Paul writes here, these things, although they are a part of heaven, they're not the main part of heaven. We've all seen those posters, maybe for some show in the town or for some concert. And there's the headline act. And there it is, right in the middle of the poster. <coughs> in large font. And then there are loads of other little supporting acts and you never really see them. You have to stop and look and think, oh right, this person's going to be there too or, or that group's going to be there as well. But there in the middle, in bold, the main event is this. That's what Paul's doing here. Oh, we're going to rest from our labors. We're not going to have sorrow, tribulation, any of those things. They're just all the supporting cast. Paul says... Heaven is to be with Christ, and therefore heaven is far better. Isn't that where his tension lies? Look there at verse uh, 22. For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I cho shall choose I wot not, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. Heaven is to be with Christ. Now, if you were to take that to the street with one of these polls that you find people doing, asking questions, asking questions often that get very stupid answers. But if you were to take it out and say to the average person, now, what do you think heaven will be like? What would they say? It was always interesting to me ministering in the UK, particularly with families, and they were unconverted. But catastrophe would strike the family, death. And they weren't one bit interested in heaven before, but now heaven has become important. But heaven as defined by themselves. And they would say sentimental but silly little things like this, well, God wanted another angel. And they would weep and they would try to comfort themselves with these things. Children, you don't become an angel when you die. You don't. Or, I know I'm going to see them again. But you think, well, what ground have you got for that? But their whole concept of heaven is like God's going to, like that. God's going to make, make them an angel and then we're going to go and see everybody again and we're going to have a great big party in the sky. Then you have other religious views like Islam. The Islamic view of heaven is essentially sensual. Particularly if you're a man. You're going to get all of these virgins all of these virgins in heaven. I'd submit to you that there's a reason for that. That you're looking at a religion that is starkly void of intimacy with God. God's like this abstract sovereign block. You can't really know him. So heaven becomes a place of sensual intimacy. The things that you enjoy in this life perfected. There are similar dangers in the Christian world. You ever find Christians prying into 
about what heaven's going to be like and they ask all these speculative questions and give equally speculative answers or they go to scripture and they try to get the answer but they overemphasize one part and they misinterpret others so you've got all these songs about when we're going to walk along the streets of gold and walk through the pearly gates and we're all going to have palm branches and so on you say wait a minute does the bible not say that well it does in the book of revelation which is a vision and these things are not to be interpreted literally as if heaven is going to be a perfect cube and the streets are going to be with gold and there are going to be 12 gates and they're going to literally be made of these precious stones. That's a vision given to a struggling church of glory. It's going to be a place of purity and praise and glory. Never mind the gold and the jewels. say ah but there's an earthly side to heaven at the last day Jesus is going to come and he's going to renew heaven and earth and he is and we're going to inhabit a new earth with resurrected human bodies and we are well are there going to be animals in heaven and are we going to work in heaven and are we going to play in heaven and are we going to enjoy Beethoven in heaven When you read the Bible, the Bible says the main event is Christ. We are going to be with Christ in heaven. And whatever these other things are, they're sideshows in comparison with that. And we are going to be taken up in worship and devotion and adoration and the enjoyment of Jesus Christ forever. Just like he prayed. Father, I will that those whom you have given me be with me where I am. What for? To work? To enjoy Bach? What for? That they might behold my glory. And every one of Jesus' prayers is answered. Now you're going to die and I'm going to die. And so, some of us have suffered the loss of loved ones who've died in Christ. But you see when that happens, Jesus has had his prayer answered. It's a good way to think about death. Jesus asked for this and it was given him. And now my Christian loved one is in the presence of God. Mm. He's with Christ and he's beholding the glory of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be our occupation. And at the resurrection we will look upon him with our physical eye. We will mm. see him like Job prophesied and hoped in. And at the same time we will have spiritual perception of soul the like of which we have never had in this world so that physically and spiritually together not by faith anymore but by sight we will appropriate and enjoy Jesus for eternity and when you read what Paul says here surely we're left in no doubt that this must be the most attractive thing about heaven to the believer is it? Is that what you think of when you think about going to heaven? I'm going to see Christ. I'm going to know Christ. I'm going to love him more than I've ever loved him. I'm going to be with him without absence. I'm going to fellowship with him without distance. And I'm going to serve him without hindrance. Is that the attraction of heaven to you? Is it attractive to you on earth that you might want to behold the glory of Christ? Sitting at the Lord's table, is it saying to yourself, I love this. I can't get enough of this. I want to know more and more and more of the Lord Jesus Christ while I live in this world. 
if that's not your Christian experience, why do you think you would even be interested in heaven? Paul says, here, here is the first side of this tension. I'm pulled towards heaven because heaven is to be with Christ. But he adds this. Not only is heaven to be with Christ, goes without saying, heaven is far better. Heaven is far better. Now let's bring in those supporting acts. What else do we enjoy in heaven? What will it be for us? Not only will we be with Christ, but first of all here, we will exchange the curse for a crown. We will exchange the curse for a crown. We're born into this world in sin and we battle with sin the whole of our lives. And even as Christians, it is the greatest cause of our distress. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And a day is coming when the Lord Jesus Christ will do just that. And all of the attendant miseries of sin that we experience in this life, sickness, pain, sweat, toil. When you read of heaven in the Bible, it's a place of absence. Can you turn, please, to Revelation chapter 21? And by absence, I mean that John lists a number of no mores here. He's telling us what's not going to be in heaven. Revelation chapter uh, 21 and verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So there's no more death, there's no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. For the former things are passed away. Now, chapter 22, verse 3 to verse 5. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and their name, his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they, shall, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. Sin and sorrow is gone. Well, isn't that attractive to us as Christians? If you have any sensitivity to sin, can you, can you even imagine what it will be like to be sinless? Never a lustful thought, never an angry word, never a wrong perception of your brother, Never disciplining your children in the wrong attitude. Never disciplining your children at all. But all the things we struggle with in this life, gone. Perfect in soul and body. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more crying. No more affliction. The former things have passed away. Not only do we exchange the curse for a crown, we exchange our fight for a feast. Throughout the whole of our Christian life, we're battling. It's relentless. We're fighting our own deceitful lusts because we're our own worst enemy. We're warring against a subtle and powerful devil. And we're battling against the world, which is inconducive and hostile to our Christianity. So that while we live in this world, we are always in our armor. It's like the soldier in the midst of the battle. He doesn't lay off his armor to sleep. We're always in our armor. But we cross the line from time to eternity. And the war is over. And we lay down our armor. And we sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we exchange our warfare in this world with everlasting fellowship with God in Christ. Thou preparest the table before, before me in the presence of mine enemies, says David. That was respite. That was 
That was something to keep him going in this world. But in this day, God's just going to destroy all your enemies and eternity is going to be the feast. Heaven is far better because we exchange the fight for a feast. Thirdly, heaven is far better because we exchange a fraction for fullness. We exchange a fraction for fullness. What you have here in this world is partial. By that I don't mean prejudicial, but I mean it is in part. It's a fraction of the whole. But when you see him face to face, you are going to have what David describes as fullness. You sang it earlier in Psalm 16. In thy presence is not fraction of joy. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures evermore. Psalm 17 verse 15 I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness that was the psalmist's hope but reflecting back on his present condition he's admitting something he's not satisfied there and then his satisfaction is future it's going to come when he stands in the presence of the Lord when he's transformed by that beatific vision into the very image of of the Lord himself. Well, in this world, Christ satisfies the longing soul. We know what it is to come to Jesus and drink of that fountain where if a man drinks, he'll never thirst again. We know what that's like. It's good. But Paul says, heaven is greater. In this world, we get glimpses of the Lord Jesus Christ and our, our, fill, our hearts are filled with joy. But in heaven, we are going to have the eternal sight of God in Jesus Christ. And our whole eternal occupation is to be studying the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You'll have a heightened capacity You'll have resurrected bodies. But even then, your perfected soul and your resurrected body will not be able to contain it. But forever and forever, it will be overflowing with joy and love as more and more of the knowledge of God is revealed to you. We just had the hurricane and we didn't get the winds, but last Monday we got an awful lot of rain. Something strange happened in my backyard. In the middle of the backyard, water started bubbling up. And for a day and a half, it was like a river. And it had no obvious starting place. It wasn't flowing through. It was actually coming up from the ground and starting and flowing down the yard into the neighbors. What had happened? Well, I don't know exactly, but I figured that the water level had risen up and the ground just couldn't cope anymore and the water just started bursting out over the top streaming that's going to be the experience of your resurrected soul and body forever you're not going to be able to contain what God reveals to you eternally in the vision of him you're going to be like that what is this artesian well it's going to just keep overflowing and overflowing forever and forever the fraction is going to be exchanged for the fullness. So that's the first thing. The Christian is pulled to heaven. But Paul also tells us here that the Christian is anchored to earth. That's the tension. For me to depart and be with Christ is far better, he says. But verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may more, be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. So the Christian is anchored for earth. Paul has a desire for earth here, but it's not, it's not a, an earthly mind. 
He goes on in chapter 3, is it to condemn that? That's the problem with some people. They've got an earthly mind. They desire earthly things. Their God is their belly. So he's not looking at the world in that sense. Paul's reason, Paul's anchor to this earth is actually selflessness. He wants to remain in order that he might serve Christ and be of use to Christ's church. Well, we ought to have that in our Christian experience too. We're like the ship in the harbor. We're anchored through these eternal winds that they're pulling us out. We want to depart. But here we are. We've got to work. Do you therefore, like Paul, have this desire to live, to be fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ? Look at verse 22 and the beginning. He says, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. He's thinking about life in this world and he wants it to be fruitful. His aim, you remember, in verse 20 was whether I live or whether I die, I want to magnify Jesus Christ in my body. I want to be fruitful for him. I want to see souls saved. I want to see churches established. I want to see believers built up in the faith. I want to see uh, kingdoms conquered for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you read this portion, you see that this is how Paul lived. And in a sense, he's challenging us by his life and saying to you and me, this is the way you as believers ought to live in this world. Do you have a desire to be fruitful for Christ? And is that desire found in harmony with this desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better? It's a dilemma, isn't it? Well, do we not learn that this dilemma is not such as it makes a Christian sit around thinking about heaven? while he does nothing on earth. Well, that was been, that's been a mistake in the past in the church, you know. Let's separate from the world, the stylites, crazy guys. They went out into the wilderness in Egypt and they stood on the top of these great pillars. And that was them. They were devoted to God. They were separated from the world. People had to throw food up to them. That's, that's not what heavenly mindedness does. He- heavenly mindedness actually roots us in the earth as well as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, that great chapter 15, where he's dealing there with the resurrection, the most concentrated place he deals with the resurrection in the whole of the Bible. And he says, There's a day coming. And the trumpet is going to sound and the dead are going to be raised incorruptible. And we're going to be changed. And death is going to be swallowed up in victory. But how does he end that chapter? What does he say? He says, wherefore, in other words, on the back of everything I've just taught you about the resurrection, wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Tension, yes, but no contradiction. You see, the eternal perspective of such joy and reward that we have described actually spurs the Christian to be faithful in this world now. If we are going to enjoy such a reward, will we not honor him? Will we not serve him while we live in this world? And again, that thought of eternity, it does something else. It presses upon the Christian the urgency of time. You start to think of forever, children. You'll tie your brain in in knots. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You know, you could say that forever. And I'll just keep going on and on and on. And then you think of time. Your little life. Lived once. And yet it is to be lived for Christ. So much to do and so little time to do it in. 
I referred to Boston last night. He says that day is wasted that does not bring Christ glory. That's the way a Christian thinks who's caught in this tension. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, but I also desire to remain and serve Christ in this world, to live to be fruitful for him. But not only to be fruitful for him, to be useful for others. Verse 25 and verse verse 24 to verse 26 nevertheless to abide in the flesh is more needful for you and having this confidence I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again it's Paul saying I don't want to stay for me I want to stay for you Now, God does not need us. That's a fact. He doesn't need us in the absolute sense. But he has ordered things in the world so as to use us as means. So in that sense, we're needed. And so in the church, we need preachers. We need elders. We need deacons. We need brothers and sisters in Christ. That is the way God has designed things. And Paul's very conscious of that. He says to the believers, I want to remain in order that by my service as an apostle, as a preacher of the word, I may be of benefit to you. How many times he writes to the church in Rome and elsewhere, he says, I long to be with you that I might impart some spiritual gift unto you. He's a servant of others. So when he says here, heaven is far better, he then looks at the need of the church in the world, and that need weighs heavier upon him than his own promotion to glory. Is that the way we think as Christians? Do you have a sense that you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is eternity in your heart as a living reality and hope? If that's the case, you cannot but have the concern of the church of Jesus Christ within your heart. They come together. We need preachers and Preachers ought to have that desire. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Let not my my tongue be silent. Let me preach and forever hold out the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me reach one more and then another and then another. It should be instinctive in the heart of a preacher. Let me care for your flock. There are grievous wolves around, Lord. He should be burdened. Not that he's their saviour, but he's concerned. Help me to feed them. Help me to protect them. Help me to guard them and lead them to glory. Help me to help them to heaven. So ministers ought to be pulled to heaven, but anchored on earth. Many times they'll lose that perspective. And it won't be for spiritual reasons. It will be because heaven seems a lot easier than earth. And I'll think, Lord, I know I ought to love and shepherd and feed this flock, but this flock, they're giving me a lot of sore toes. and It's difficult. Heaven would be easier. But he ought to realize that service to Christ is service to men in this world for Christ ministers and elders pulled towards heaven yet anchored to earth but then you as Christians likewise pulled toward heaven and anchored to earth and the sense of eternity laid heavily upon your heart time is short brethren and you are to work while it is called today because the night is coming when not one of you will be able to work again. You will not have the opportunity 
to speak to your children again. You will not have the opportunity to reach out to your neighbors again. You will never again be able to lift up your voice in praise in this world to God. You will never be able to take a stand in the community for Jesus Christ again. It's over. Oh, you're in glory and it's wonderful, but but that's gone. And while you're on earth, that ought to impact you. So here we are, docked in this harbor, and the eternal winds are blowing us out to sea, and the tide is drawing us towards this blessed hope and glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. But while we're docked in this harbor, we're here to labor. So you as a Christian like Paul, you ought to be caught on the horns of this dilemma because real Christian experience knows what it is to be torn. But how do we resolve it? Well, we resolve it by feeding both desires. By feeding both desires until God comes and cuts the anchor. And we, like Paul, can say, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Let's stand for prayer.